Hello, nurses. This is Mrs. Ignacio, and this lecture is for PNR 104, Chapter 19. Okay, so hygiene, personal care, skin care, prevention of pressure injuries. That's what we're going to get into. So I want you to think about hygiene and understand that your version or your definition of hygiene may be different from your patient. So we have to take those kinds of things into consideration consideration when we're working with our patients. So we're going to describe the structure and function of the integumentary system. We'll talk about factors that influence personal hygiene practices, skin areas that are the most susceptible to pressure injuries, and in clinical practice, we're going to describe how to prevent and stage a pressure injury. Understand that your skin is the first line of defense against injury and infection. When we think about the skin or the integumentary system, we're thinking skin, hair, nails, and glands. So integumentary system consists of skin, hair, nails, and glands. So let's talk about sweat and sebaceous glands. So yes, we know that the skin is the largest organ of the body and it does have two layers, two main layers. The top layer that we see that is actually waterproof and has cells that are dead, they die in a specialized way. They are keratinized. The epidermis contains these keratinized cells and that makes our skin waterproof. Again, the top layer of the skin is the epidermis and it is waterproof and the cells die in a specialized way. They are keratinized. So the epidermis also contains uh, different layers. One of the layers is the stratum corneum. The second layer is the stratified epithelial tissue and in this stratified epithelial tissue, we have melanocytes. Remember, melanocytes are responsible for making melanin, and melanin determines the patient's complexion. So the more melanin a patient has, the darker their skin will be, okay? So the epidermis does not contain blood vessels. If you need a visual, go to your textbook on page 302 and you will see the layers of the skin. Remember the top layer of the skin is the epidermis. It is waterproof and it, the cells are dead, okay? They die in a specialized way called keratinization. Now, the layer underneath the epidermis is sometimes called the cor corium, but we'll call it the dermis. There's a lot going on in the dermis. There's connective tissue that is dense. It is strong. It is elastic. There's blood vessels and nerves, hair follicles. There's fibroblast glands. So... This is really important to understand that the dermis has a lot going on, okay? Again, nerve ending, there's glands, hair follicles, sweat glands, all important things that are going on in the dermis. Now, the hair and the nails are actually dead, so that's why it doesn't hurt when we clip our nails. It doesn't hurt when we get a haircut. However, at the follicle, the root, that's alive. So it does hurt if we pluck a hair out or if we pluck our eyebrows, okay? Let's talk about mucous membranes because that's a part um, that we need to kind of focus on because that tells us a lot of information about the patient. Now, the mucous membrane is not strictly a part of the integumentary system. So when we think about the mucous membranes, they line the cavities or passages of the body. So when we think about mucous membranes, you might be thinking about your oral mucosa, your nasal mucosa, right? So mucous membranes. So the mucous membranes also serve to protect against bacterial invasion. And guess what? The mucous membranes secrete mucus. The mucous membranes also absorb fluid and electrolytes, specifically the small intestines. 
okay? That's where we absorb our nutrients uh, after the food is broken down, okay? So here's a cross section of the skin. This figure is also found in your textbook on page 308. Uh, no, 302, sorry. So this picture is found in your textbook on page 302. So the skin serves for protection. It's the first line of defense against injury and infection, against any pathogens that want to get into our body and cause us harm. The skin can also protect us against thermal damage, chemical damage, and mechanical damage or injuries. The sebaceous glands help to make the skin waterproof because they secrete an oil that is called sebum. Okay, the skin is also important for sensation. We feel uh, touch, light touch, heavy touch, pressure, pain, heat, and cold. The skin also helps us with temperature regulation. If we are too hot, then the uh, blood vessels uh, that are inside of the dermis of the skin will actually dilate to release uh, some extra heat. If we are cold, those blood vessels will constrict. So here's a visual. When you, the next time you get out of the shower, look at your skin, a warm shower, I should say, you will see that your veins are gonna be very visible on your arms and pretty much you know, on your chest. You, you'll be able to see them because they are dilating to release the heat. So same goes, if a patient is cold, it's gonna be very difficult to draw their blood because their blood vessels will be constricting trying to keep the heat in. The skin also serves for excretion and secretion. When we talk about excretion, the skin helps to secrete sweat, which cools the body by evaporative cooling. Uh, sweat glands also not only make sweat, but they also help to excrete extra salts. Uh, out of the body. So that's why sweat is salty. The sweat glands also help to excrete nitrogenous waste. We detoxify when we sweat. Okay, so sweat glands are located also in the axilla and the genitalia. Uh, and so we have sebaceous glands that make sebum. And these are, sebum is a natural oil. And sebum lubricates the skin, the hair, and it keeps the, our skin pliable and elastic. And sebum also serves to decrease heat loss and decrease bacterial growth. Now, there are some changes that we have to think about when we are talking about aging. In your textbook on page 302, it gives you a list of things. So as a patient ages, they have a loss of elastic fibers and that causes the skin to wrinkle and to sag. The skin becomes thinner, fragile, slower to heal. There's decreased sebaceous gland activity. So the skin becomes dry and itchy. Temperature control is altered. And the, as the th skin becomes thinner, our patient also will lose that subcutaneous layer of fat. And so they will be more sensitive to cold. Hair becomes thinner as the patient gets older and it also grows more uh, slowly. And the hair tends to lose its color because of the loss of melanocytes. And remember, melanocytes secrete melanin. Okay, so let's talk about hygiene. That's going to be really important uh, for our patients, right? Florence Nightingale told us about the importance of hygiene in our patients. So when we're helping to care for our patients, we have to take care of their hair, their skin, their teeth, their nails to protect their body from infection. So there's things that affect the patient's hygiene. One can be socioeconomic backgrounds. Maybe they are in a rural part of America where they may not have uh, you know, plenty of fresh running water. Um, and you may be thinking, this is America, but not everyone has all of the amenities that you and I may have. So economic status can be a factor. Um, knowledge level can be a factor. People may not know. You don't know what you don't know. Um, you know, ability to perform self-care, it could be due to cognitive issues, maybe physical limitations, 
It also could be personal preferences. There's a big thing now with the Hollywood folks saying that they don't shower every day. They don't, you know, uh, let their kids bathe every day, only when dirt is visible, that kind of thing. So that's their personal preference. Again, self-care abilities and also cultural differences. These are all things that could affect your patient's hygiene practices. And we have to be aware of that and respect our patient's wishes. Okay, so let's take a look at page 303, skin and pressure injuries. So pressure injury is an injury that forms um, with an area that does not have proper circulation, okay? Um, so the skin, when we have skin, it normally blanches or becomes pale if we press on. We know that if we press an area of skin and it is non-blanchable, that is a sign that the patient is developing a pressure ulcer. That is a stage one pressure ulcer, okay? Now, once we press on the area, that skin will become pale. When we release it, it should go back to the color that's appropriate for the patient's ethnicity. And that is called blanching. But if it's non-blanchable, if it's pink and it stays pink, then that is a cause for concern. Okay, so you have to understand, we want the skin to blanch. If it's non-blanchable, that is not a good sign. Okay, so who is at risk for pressure injury? Well, patients that are immobile or bed bound, patients that have incontinence of urine, incontinence of bowel, patients that have diaphoresis, which is sweating, patients that have inadequate nutrition, specifically protein, zinc, vitamin A, C, and E, patients that have lowered mental awareness, they may not realize that something's going on with their skin. They may not realize that they had incontinence. Patients that have excessive diaphoresis, patients that are very uh, advanced in age, and patients that have edema, which is swelling. If you go to your textbook on page 304, it gives you this information, and it talks about the skin assessment, the Braden scale. So the Braden scale is what we use every shift for patients to see what is their risk for pressure injury. So we will use the Braden scale and we're going to pay particular attention over the, the skin that's over the bony prominences like the spine, the sacrum. Okay. And we will check these pressure areas when we're turning and repositioning our patient. So here we have the stages and in your textbook on page 305, we have the stages of pressure ulcer. The higher the number, uh, the increasing, more serious it's becoming. Now, stage one is an area of reddened skin that does not blanch when touched. Okay, it can be discolored um, uh, in people that have darker skin. Okay, there could be warmth or edema. Remember, edema is swelling. And an induration may be present. An induration, uh, you may be thinking, oh, they talk about that with a TB test. Well, it's a hardened area. Okay, so that's stage one. Stage two is a partial thickness skin loss. It might look like an abrasion, a, a blister, or shallow crater. Surrounding skin may feel warmer. Stage three, full thickness skin loss. So it looks like a deep crater. It may extend into the fascia. Subcutaneous tissue could be damaged or necrotic. Necrotic means dead, so it could be black. Stage four, this is full thickness loss with extensive tissue necrosis, which is death or damage to the muscle or supporting structures. It may appear dry and black. So here's some visuals and a picture is worth a thousand words when we look at these different pressure ulcers. So A shows you stage one, B is stage two, and C is stage three. So D is gonna be stage four. And then we have E, which is um, unstageable, okay? E is unstageable and F is a deep, tissue pressure injury. So 
this is really not what you want for your patient, okay? So we really wanna prevent these injuries if possible. So we want to turn and reposition our patient because that's one of the ways that we can help them, pre prevent them from getting these pressure injuries. So every two hours is the standard. If you see a test question and it says three, four hours, that's not the right answer. Every two hours. Keep the heels of the patient that is immobilized off the bed. So we will float their heels with pillows or maybe Prevlon boots or sheepskin lined boots. We want to avoid positioning the patient directly on the trochanter, okay? And that is your, your femur. Okay, so we use a trapeze or lift to help the patient to change their position. We use pressure reducing devices. So foam pads, specialized mattresses. We also use pressure reducing devices for patients in wheelchairs. They may have a specialized pillow, sometimes it's called a donut. We also teach the patient to shift their weight. So if the patient can move around on their own, we want them to move around to help shift the weight, get the weight off of that particular area so they can improve circulation. That's going to be uh, important for this patient to do. We also want to restore circulation by rubbing around the redden area. Now you have to be careful because I've seen a lot of test questions and it says massage bony prominences. We do not massage bony prominences, okay? We do not massage bony prominences, okay? That's very important. Okay, um, and so here that point is a wash and dry incontinent patients promptly avoid mechanical injury from cast braces, etc. And we want to avoid skin injury by friction and shear. And we talked about that in chapter 18. We also want to provide adequate nutrition and hydration and protein is going to be one of the key things that we look for. So when we care for our patients, we want to use a team approach. You're partnering with everyone that's caring for the patient. And when we think about if the patient does have a pressure injury, we want to have wound debridement. Okay, and that is removing the dead skin cells. We're cleansing the wounds. We're applying our dressings. Uh, we want to use sterile technique. We don't want to introduce infection into the wound. If the wound is infected, we can expect that the doctor will prescribe antibiotic therapy. And sometimes surgery is needed to uh, repair some of these wounds. So when we're using our nursing process, we're thinking, okay, we assess the wound. We assess our patients. The nursing diagnosis of a patient that does have a pressure injury could be pain. So it is very, very painful. So make sure you medicate the patient 30 minutes to an hour prior to performing any wound care. This patient may have chronic low self-esteem, chronic pain. They may have a self-care deficit. They may have imbalanced nutrition, less than body requirements, specifically in the area of protein. That tells me I also have have to check their lab values. I'm looking at their albumin. Albumin is protein. The patient may have impaired physical mobility, impaired skin integrity, ineffective peripheral tissue perfusion, and risk for impaired skin integrity. So here's a question for you. This is question number one. Okay, which of the following is not a function of the integumentary system? Is it protection, provides color, temperature regulation, excretion, and secretion? Take a moment to think about it. And the correct answer is two, provides color. That's not a function of the integumentary system. You may be saying, well, okay, yeah, there's melanocytes that produce melanin, but the main job of the skin, right, or of the integumentary system is protection against injury and infection, controlling and helping to regulate temperature and excretion and secretion, uh, making oils, making sweat. Okay, so those are the, the functions of the integumentary system. Okay, question two, Justin has a patient in a long-term care facility with a pressure injury. It can be described as a full thickness loss that looks like a deep crater and extends to the fascia. Okay, subcutaneous tissue is damaged. What stage is this injury? This is actually, uh, think, think about it. This is a stage three. 
okay? This is a stage three injury. So stage one is an area of redness. Stage two involves partial thickness skin loss uh, involving the epidermis or dermis. Stage four involves full thickness, oh, I'm sorry, full thickness skin loss with extensive tissue necrosis or damage to the muscle, bone, or structure. So stage four, it's pretty deep, pretty painful. All right, so in clinical practice, what you're going to be doing your skills lab, you're going to learn about bed baths, back rub, how to perform oral care on the unconscious patient. Those are all important things for you to do. You're going to learn about nail care, mouth care, peri care, how to shave, how to assist the patient with contact lenses, and how to help the patient prevent buildup of cerumen in the ears. So when we plan, we wanna make sure that we plan for the patient's skin integrity to be maintained. We want the patient's hair to be clean and neatly styled and the patient's mouth to be intact and free from odor. So when we are actually implementing, we are bathing the patient, we're cleansing the skin, promoting comfort, promoting circulation, removing any waste products. The water should be warm, but should not burn the patient. I feel like that's a test question. Okay, the water should be warm, but not should not burn the patient. May need to give either a partial or complete bed bath. Please don't expose the patient. Only expose the part that you're working on at that time. So it could you could give the patient a bath in bed or in a tub or in a shower using a shower chair. It just depends. You may need to use assistive devices like the chair or the stool in the, the shower or the tub, especially if the patient is weak and cannot stand for long periods of time. Now, there is such a thing that is a therapeutic bath, and this is really uh, great because it promotes circulation. There is a whirlpool bath, and it really it cleanses, but it also stimulates peripheral circulation. A sits bath it applies moist heat and cleanses the peri area, and medication can be added to the water. A sits bath is something that we would do for our postpartum patients or anybody that has Mary, uh, maybe a perianal um, kind of injury that could be very helpful. A sponge bath could be used if a patient is febrile. Febrile means that they have a fever or elevated temperature. Now, a bag bath is a variation of the bed bath, and this is a bag and it just has wipes. Now, these wipes can should be warmed and um, they have a cleansing agent. So sometimes there's CHG baths or sometimes there's specialized moisturizing baths. And this is, you know, these wipes pretty much that have these special cleansing agents. Okay, so we want to use different cloths for different areas of the body. So I would not use a cloth that I use on the patient's peri area on their face. Okay, so you want to make sure that, uh, you know, one for each leg, one for each arm, one for the main body, and then, um, you know, you might need extra claws for the peri area. Okay, so that's the problem with these, um, you know, bath and bags is that it's very expensive. All right, let's talk about bathing the older adults, okay? So you don't want to, again, expose them. And this is, a, I feel like this is a test question too. For your elderly patient, a full bath is not required every day, okay? So the water should be warm. Keep the patient covered. Only uncover the part that you're working with, okay? Warm water, not hot. Minimal amounts of mild soap for your older adult, Okay, we want to rinse thoroughly and pat dry. We don't want to rub. That can actually tear the skin. We also want to be very careful about preventing slips and falls. That's going to be really important. So let's talk about the back massage. So the back massage is something that unfortunately as nurses, we don't always have a lot of time to do, but if you can do it for a couple minutes, it's going to be a great way to bond with your patient. It communicates caring. It really boosts the nurse patient relationship. It also stimulates circulation of blood. It reduces tension. It promotes relaxation. And this is essential for patients who are bed bound. And this should be performed during morning care. All right, let's talk about peri care. That's perineal care. 
So we are going to make sure that we maintain a matter of a fact attitude. We're not going to make a big deal about it. We're not going to be making any jokes or any sexual suggestive conversation. It's not appropriate. We're gonna maintain our professionalism and maintain the patient's dignity because it's embarrassing. What if you couldn't wipe your own backside? How would you feel if you were depending on somebody to do that for you? So we really wanna maintain our professionalism. All right, let's talk about mouth care. Mouth care is so important uh, for the conscious patient, also more important for the unconscious patient. When we think about mouth care, think about all the millions of bacteria that's in our mouth. You want the patient, if they're conscious, to be at 45 to 90 degrees, right? Put the towel under the chin, moisten the toothbrush, spread it with toothpaste, brush from the gum line to the edge of the teeth, have the patient rinse the mouth and spit. Provide cloth or tissue to mic the mouth when finished. Now, if the patient is able to do this on his or her own, just set it up and let them do it. Let them care for their mouth. Okay, so when, go back. Now, we also, for the unconscious patient, it's very, very important. We want to provide full mouth care at least once every eight hours. And if the patient is mouth breathing, like if they're on a ventilator, we want them to be having their mouth care done every four hours. Because guess what? The bacteria that's in their mouth can actually go and cause an infection in their heart. So, okay, so that's really important. Okay, evidence has shown that that is a possibility. So mouth care is very, very important. Okay, we want to remove any dry secretions because they can cause halitosis and we must moist swab the mouth every two hours or as needed to maintain the integrity of the oral cavity. If your patient has dentures, okay, we will spread a towel. We will take the dentures out, and yes, we will clean the oral mucosa. Just because we're cleaning the dentures, that's not it. We have to clean the mouth, the gums of the patient, okay? Now, when we're caring for the dentures, don't wrap them up in tissue because they can be thrown away in the trash. But again, when you're brushing the dentures, you'll do this in a skilled lab. Put a towel at the bottom of the sink. You're not going to use hot water. You're not going to use cold water. Hot water can actually uh, cause them to become damaged, expand. Cold water can crack them. We're going to use um, warm water. Okay, so really, really important. Hair care. Use a clean brush or comb from the scalp. Okay, decrease the pulling. Okay, um, you, we will... Um, maybe use alcohol or astringents to, or water to get any loosened hair strands that are, are strands that are tangled or matted and comb one section at a time. When we're shampooing our patient's hair, we're removing dirt, blood sometimes. They could have been in a motor vehicle accident, right? They could have some injuries. And when we shampoo, we help to circulate circulation of the scalp and it helps with brushing and combing. And this can be done in the shower, in the bath, or the bed, or the sink. When we are shaving our patients, we're going to be removing hair from the surface of the skin and we can shave the patient's face, their legs, their axilla. These are all things that we could uh, possibly do for our patient, okay? All things that we could possibly do for our patient. And we want to go with the grain. We want to be gentle, use short, short strokes and a safety razor. If your patient is on bleeding precautions, do not use a straight edge razor. Please use an electric razor. When we are caring for our patient's nails, we will cut them straight across. We will use an orange wood stick to clean under the nails and push the cuticles back gently, okay? Um, we will usually uh, clean the nails also when the patient is in the bath. Now, if your patient has glasses, you can use warm water and a soft cloth to wipe the glasses dry. If the patient has contact lenses, you must wash your hands thoroughly. Do not use hand sanitizer, okay, even though you're going to be wearing gloves because it can burn the patient's eyes. There may be hard or soft contact lenses, although I don't know if people still wear hard contact lenses during this time, right? 
but clean the contact lenses with commercially prepared cleaning solution and you'll moisten the lens and rub it between the fingers. Now, sometimes our patients have artificial eyes, and so we may have to actually remove the eye daily for cleaning, okay? That's something that may have to be done, okay? So we want to carefully remove the eye, and we'll pull down the lower lid and put a little pressure just below the eye and cup your hand underneath it. So when it falls out, you'll catch it, okay? Don't let it roll on the floor like that uh, iguana. What's it? Iguana from the movie Sing, right? Um, I forget her name. She's um, the secretary to the koala bear, but her eye pops out all the time. So don't let that happen to your patient with an artificial eye. Cleanse with normal saline, okay? That's going to be uh, important, all right? Cleanse with normal saline. If your patient has a hearing aid, you want to make sure you remove it every night, uh, turn it off, place it in a sealed container with the patient's label. Okay, don't submerge the hearing aid in water. If the hearing aid is not working, check the battery, make sure the battery is installed correctly, make sure that there's no cracks in the hearing aid. And we clean the hearing aid to prevent any buildup of earwax. Because if there's a buildup of earwax, the patient won't be able to hear with the hearing aid. Lastly, we want to evaluate the patient. We want to say, okay, the patient has no evidence of redness, irritation. They have their skin integrity. Those are all important things. The hair is clean and styled neatly per the patient's preference. Mucous membranes are pink and moist without symptoms of irritation and odor. So that's what you're looking for when you're caring for your patient. So this is your discussion of chapter 19. Remember to think like a nurse.